All right, all right. We're live. Yo, yo. Dominique, what's going on, man? Man, I just woke up from a nap about 10 minutes ago, so I wanted to make sure I had some energy before we jumped on this call. No doubt, man. Uh, actually, I just woke up Did about you? an hour ago, so yeah, <laughs> yeah oh, it's, it's the morning now over here. Where are you it's, at? It's uh, 11 a.m., so, you know, the, the time difference is, uh, yeah, in Korea. Yeah, it's I, perfect I though. A long day. I did leg day. I had a couple of clients that I met with and did some sessions. And so I'm like, I need to take a nap or else I would have been low energy this whole call. So. All right. Well, you know, nowadays in, uh, in sports, right. And not even just in sports, I guess in combat sports in general, um, the mental aspect of the game has been coming up a lot, right? Because a lot of these guys that are fighting now in the UFC or any promotion at the highest level, they are physically, they're at their peak, right? There's no doubt yeah. about that. It's just the other aspects of the sport that are starting to come in now. And you are part of that wave, right? You're a big yeah. part of that wave. And the first thing I wanted to get into is with you is how did you get into hypnotherapy like is that something that you're into when you're a young kid you know like watching you know hypnotists or how did you, no, know, that, did you end up this way uh so i've always studied like nlp and the mind and and, and all that stuff and kind of looked at hypnosis but i always thought it was fake or whatever so about two years ago me and my girl would move to vegas and we went to hypnosis show and then I don't, again, I had always thought it was fake, but I was seeing the people live on stage and I just thought to myself, there's no way that people are acting. Like I'm a very good, um, I can tell when people are lying or they're acting and now it's part of my job. And so I, I just got a feeling like, man, this stuff's real. And I never really looked into it. So long story short, my mom, she actually, she, she has a successful business doing insurance and, and, and a couple other things, but she took this course on NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. It's kind of like the stuff that uh, Tony Robbins is really well known for and some other things. And part of the course was hypnotherapy. So I ended up, I was really interested in it. I was like, I've always wanted to learn how to do that, but I never really know where to go. So fast forward, and I kept asking her, like, when are they doing this thing? When are they doing this thing? So for Christmas, she had actually uh, bought me this, this to go to this school. So I went to the school, um, yeah. went through it, and I just felt like, man, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Like, this is my purpose. You know, because before that, I'd sold insurance for years, and I was always in this kind of gray zone where I wasn't super happy and loving my life, but I also wasn't super depressed by any means, but I was just kind of in this weird um, state where nothing cool was going on. So when I found this, I was just like, all right, this is it. This is my purpose. So, and then ever since then, I've just been completely obsessed with it. It pretty much consumes all of my thoughts uh, throughout the day. Like my girl, she'll be talking to me and I'm just sitting there thinking, I'm like, all right, how am I going to do this, uh, this induction or, you know, how am I going to work with this person? And she gets mad because sometimes I just, I'm just, I'm out, I'm out, you know, I'm, I'm out of the room, but yeah. So that's how I got into it. You know, it's just kind of happened, you know? Now, what, you know, like a lot of people, they see this on TV, you know, and they will have a lot of doubts about it. What are some of the main misconceptions, you know, like when you run into people and, and start working with them, they, they must have like a preconceived misconceptions about what's going on with hip, hypnosis, right? So what are some of the main ones that you can like break for us? One of the main ones is that they can't be hypnotized. And the thing is, is that literally every person is hypnotizable because all hypnosis is, is that it's a state of trance. And to give you an idea, I mean, we've all been you know, driving in our cars and all of a sudden we just zone off and then we come back to it like five or 10 minutes later and we're like, holy shit, who is just driving right now? Right. Or maybe you're in the gym and you're working out and then you kind of just zone off. You get stuck on something. You know, I, I used to daydream a lot when I was cl in class. 
So that daydreaming state or that uh, trance state is a very light level of hypnosis. So everybody can do hypnosis. And it's funny because, you know, I'll get these people and they're like, nah, bro, you know, I'm too, I'm too strong minded to be hypnotized and this and that. And I'm like, you know, I'm working with some of the top athletes in the world. And not only that, but fighters and fighters, you know, have the strongest mindsets out of anybody. And so it just makes me laugh. So everybody can do hypnosis. Um, and, and another thing is people will say, nah, my, my, my willpower is too strong. My willpower is too strong to be hypnotized. The, the funny thing is, what is easier to just completely say, no, I'm not going to go through this process. I'm just going to resist it and just not do it. Or to allow yourself to get to those deep levels of trance where you can make these positive changes in your life. And I'm, I'm, you know, I already know the answer, the, the latter. It's, it's more, it takes more mind power, more willpower to actually do hypnosis than to not do it. Um, so that's probably the biz, biggest misconception. Um, and also that it's like mind control or that I'm controlling you. It's not that. It's all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. I'm just there to guide you along the process. So when you see people up on a stage and they're doing very stupid things, um, those people, it's not that they're being controlled. It's just that they're very suggestible and they're willing to play along sort of. It, it's, not, it's not that they're like acting. It's that, that they're, it's almost like being drunk. Like when you're drunk, you'll do a lot of stupid things that you normally wouldn't do. It's because your conscious mind is shutting down and you're more open to these things. So you got to figure – if somebody's willing to go up on stage in front of a couple hundred people they don't even know, and they know they're going to get hypnotized, they know what the outcome is going to be. They're going to be made to look like a fool. Those people are already going into it, open to it. So not everybody can get to that level of what we call synambulism, where it looks like they're under control, but really it's just them opening up and allowing the hypnotist to do it. So those would be the, the two biggest misconceptions. Yeah, when I was a kid growing up in uh, in the suburbs of Seattle, th there was a fair every year. And at that fair, they would bring in hypnotists every year. Every year, people would go up. They would get hypnotized, like 10 or 15 people every show. And they would make them bark like a dog and, you know, uh, all kinds of wild shit. You know, like, I would never do it because I would be scared that I would go up there and get naked or something you know wow. so wild and crazy shit that would go on you know like they would film it all too um do you have you ever done that like have you ever like you know hypnotized no. people and just oh, as like a as me. like a fun show no when i got into this i was like you know what that's not really my shtick i don't want to be known as the guy that makes people you know hump uh blow up dolls or suck dildos on stage it's just not really mm -hmm. my thing uh, I was getting into more of the mental aspect of it and how it can really change your life in so many different areas. So I didn't want to start off with that. Um, so I've never done that. I've never, I've never even done it for myself. And my whole thing is I am bringing hypnosis, obviously with the help of my clients and everybody else that I work with to the mainstream and to show people that it's not what it's been perceived to be because there's so many more benefits to it that than just a stage show that uh you know that a lot of people just aren't aware of so i consider my me being like a jedi and that's kind of like the uh the darth the darth vaders and the people that kind of make it look stupid so yeah i think that those hypnotists those kind of hypnotists they have been out there running around for so long. And then that's what most people in the general public have seen. So that's what their idea of hypnotism is. And now, you know, the first experience of me, like first, first exposure of like real, like hypnotherapy, I believe that made me a believer was hearing about Mike Tyson, uh -huh. how he yeah. was hypnotized by custom auto. Right. Once I heard that story, I was, I took it a little bit more seriously. You know, I was just yeah. like, Whoa, you know, Mike Tyson back in the heyday, back in his early days, he was unstoppable. And mm -hmm. I was thinking after Cus died, 
he wasn't getting hypnotized anymore by custom model yeah. and it kind of like that was his downfall in a way and i was thinking like whoa maybe that was a you know like a, a huge part you know of mike tyson being how successful he was in the boxing arena right now when you look at what mike tyson went through what is your analysis of that as far as like his how it affect his boxing exactly oh, it, it is a hundred a, a huge factor in why he performed so well um and he like you said i've heard him on rogan i heard him on back in the days on howard stern a couple of the uh guys and he attribute he talks about it because he knows how much a, be a benefit it is you know the thing is and you already mentioned it, all these guys everybody trains hard everybody works hard and it's kind of like knuckle dragger just to just keep constantly working hard on your body all the time without working on your mentality. You know, um, you got to figure, you know, these guys go through a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, you know, there's money on the line, their families are watching all of the people that doubted them are watching their enemies are watching the whole, you know, world is watching hundreds of thousands of people and they have all this pressure and it's like, you cannot, just work that pressure into the ground. Like, yeah, obviously you have to work hard. That's, that's just, that's just the baseline. You know what I mean? This is something that will prepare them not only in the cage, but also all the way leading up to the fight when they're in sparring, when they're at home, even the relationships with their friends or family, just every aspect of their life to where things just flow smoothly. So by the time they get to the cage, they know within themselves that they have the, the, the real advantage over their partner. Because again, like I said, everybody works out three days a week. Everybody trains hard. Everybody does jujitsu. Everybody does boxing. Everybody does you know, wrestling. So what are you going to do to separate yourselves from the, from the other people? And this is basically the next level. Like we were already kind of getting to that level in MMA, how they would talk about, all right, the next level is going to be the athlete that's really good at, at martial arts. And we're kind of getting there. You can see that in, in a lot of uh, martial arts now. The next level is who's going to have a mental coach, a hypnotist, somebody who knows how to help them in those areas to take them to that next level. So, And that is my sole purpose of working with all these fighters is to completely change the way that fighters go about the mental aspect of the game. Because you know, a lot of them think, Oh, I'm mentally tough. I don't need that. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the guys that and I love it. I love working with guys that are coming off losses because then it shows when they come off a loss, a loss, how much better they do. It shows how effective it is. Sometimes when guys come off wins, they think that they know it all or they got it all figured out, which is great. Um, but uh, so, yeah, that's that's uh, it, it definitely helped out Mike Tyson, man, like like you wouldn't even know. So. Speaking of coming off a loss, Khalil Roundtree. Yeah. He came off a huge loss, right? Yeah. And he was he was the guy that went on Rogan and mentioned you as helping him out on the mental side. Talk about him and working with Khalil. And how did you even run into him? Or were you guys always friends? Did you guys train with each other? No, no. So the way I met him was one of – so I go – I train out of 10th Planet here in Henderson. And one of the guys who trains there, he's in the UFC, his name is Julian Marquez. So it kind of just happened by accident, although I had already been thinking about these are the things I want to do. And I went to go, me and my buddy went to go pick up a couch or something. And, he, and while we were doing, he's like, hey, Julian wants to go to the PI. You want to meet him there? So I said, like, cool. So we met there. And while we we're sitting there, he's like, so what's up with this hypnosis thing? Is it all bullshit? Does it really work? You know, what's up? So I said, Rather than me telling you, let me just show you. So we were going upstairs to the relaxation room and we crossed paths with Khalil and Khalil and Julian are old training partners, I think at Syndicate. So he asked what we're doing, said we're doing hypnosis and his eyes kind of lit up like, oh, really? So we exchanged numbers and I think it was like the next day or the or the, a couple of days within that. And I, and I remember I was like super slammed. I had three, four appointments a day for like three or four days in a row. And... At first, I was like, man, I'm kind of busy. We might have to do it next week. But then his fight was the very next Saturday. 
So I said, fuck it. You know, I'm just going to take this opportunity and, and, uh, and run with it. So, you know, the first day we did the work and it was probably like five hours straight. And, you know, we got done at like probably one, one thirty in the morning. And then we did some more work the, de- the next day and just right away. And, and this is the same for everybody that I work with, even whether it's fighting or not, is they just feel an immediate change in the way they feel. And he just noticed his, he was feeling loose, feeling relaxed and sparring. And we really worked heavy on the visualization. And sure enough, you know, like he said on, on the Rogan, on, on Joe Rogan is everything, how he was visualizing it happened exactly how he wanted to, the, wanted it to happen. So he just went in that fight with a very clear mind on, on what he wanted. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, especially fighters, they get anxiety, right. About the fight and, where anxiety comes from, it's not something that you have. It's something that you create. It's something that you do. So anxiety comes from thinking about something going wrong. That's all it is. It's, it's thinking about this fight. I'm going to get knocked out. I'm going to get this. I'm going to whatever they think. And so they start to get that heavy pressure. Now, all you have to do to get rid of the anxiety is just think about it going right. So if you just think about the end result of what you want, not exactly how it's going to happen or anything like that, just the end result, which is if it's winning a fight, getting your hand raised, going through the motions, seeing the doctor, all that, then the anxiety instantly disappears. So when you're in the cage, you're fighting with your, your body is loose because when you're, when you have anxiety and we've all dealt with it before, you, it feels like pressure, right? And then depending on how bad it could be all over your body. So a lot of fighters go in and they just try to, they don't know how to do it properly. There's like, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. And that's the exact wrong way you want to get rid of anxiety. And they go in and it shows in their performance. So that's kind of how we met. And then, um, yeah, and then I ended up meeting Eric because Eric was like, I guess in the back uh, after they fought, he'd asked him what he did. He's like, yeah, I got hypnotized by this guy in Vegas. And so Eric, we got in touch and he's like, yeah, man, whatever you did to him, you know, do the same for me. So I was like, all right, let's do it. And then now um, started working with Sam Alvey. He's got a fight coming up. Uh, OSP, he doesn't have a fight coming up, but we started working. Um, And Nick Newell, I I love that guy. He's super cool. I I love them all. They all have their own, uh, you know, their own things about them. But uh, Nick is just super inspirational. So uh, I worked with him and he, you know, he won his last fight in two minutes or something. And... Um, and now Juan, um, uh, Juan, the Kraken, uh, Adams, he's fighting July 20th as well against, uh, Greg Hardy. So yeah, man, it's just like one thing. And then right now I'm, I'm, I'm tapping into the NFL I already have some guys that have some sessions booked with. I can't exactly say yet. Cause I haven't talked to him about that portion. All the guys that I talk about is all, you know, I already, they already agreed to let me talk about it. If not, I just don't tell anybody, but, um, but yeah, that's how it all happened, and it just keeps keeps going up. So, yeah, incredible, man! Like how life can change within a matter of months. I think for yourself, right? That yeah, yeah. one guy you can work with can go on a show and just the the word of mouth. I think is so powerful that people don't oh, understand. It's huge, and the thing is. All of this happens sort of um, kind of uh, it just happens, but none of it happens first without me thinking about it. The funny thing is before I started working with Julian or Khalil or anything, I was telling people I'm going to work with professional fighters. That's what I'm going to do. I didn't force it. I wasn't worried about how or when I just said, that's what I'm going to do. And then boom, opportunity fell on my lap. And then after I worked with Khalil, I was watching the fight. And, and, and the announcers are just like, it's like he got through this mental block and this and that and this and that. And I'm just thinking, okay. And, I, and, I, and literally on, in that moment, I go, he's going to go on Joe Rogan. And I go, I feel like I'm going to be on Joe Rogan. Maybe not physically, but somehow, you know, one day I'll get on there. And then like three weeks later, he talks about it, which I'm so grateful for. And then, um, and then I was like, and then I put on, and I put all this stuff on my Instagram because I'm what they call a deliberate manifester, which means that you say, this is what I'm going to do. And then you do it. Uh, so after that, I go, all right, I, I used to have this idea that I wanted to work with champions, right? But the problem with that is that 
they're already at the highest level. So if I work with them, there's no real proof of what I did worked, right? Because it could be part of what I did. It could be already, already how they're feeling. So I said, I want to work with the underdogs, you know, the people, the left out lost causes, the people that people just kind of wrote off and they're like, yeah, whatever. This guy just came off a two or three fight losing streak or people don't believe in them or whatever. And it's funny, I put that out. And then the next day I meet Nick Newell. And to me, he's literally the biggest underdog of all time. You know, if a guy has one arm, he's fighting MMA. Now he's not. But I mean, in the beginning of his career, I guarantee you, everybody wrote him off, right? No, this will never happen. You have one arm, you can never do it. And then right after that, I meet Eric. He's coming off a three fight losing streak, another big underdog. And it's just like one after another after another. So yeah, man, it's just been, it's been fun and I, and I love it. And it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I'm just going to keep going until I hypnotize every person on the roster that speaks English. So. <laughs> well, then you're going to have to learn uh, Portuguese and Chinese. Like and... Only the guys that speak English. <laughs> only the well, guys that speak English. I'm not learning another language. What makes, you know, fighters, what makes them so much different from, other athletes, because I consider football players also combat sports yeah, athletes, in my opinion. 100%. 100%. Uh, the difference that I see is that, you know, the pressure that comes with it. Because in football, you know, there's an 11 other guys, plus you got defense or, you know, the other whatever, depends on what you're on, plus special teams. So there's so many other ways to spread the blame that it's very rarely one person, you know, the quarterbacks do get a lot of heat, but you know, it's also tied into, well, the line might've sucked or the running back might've missed the block. So the guy got hit and he fumbled the ball or whatever. So with football, it's a little bit more spread out as far as the, the, the blame, the guilt, the things that you can mess up on. We're fighting. It's like, look, bro, there's no, there's no, there's no excuses, you know, like, yeah, I guess you could kind of blame your coaches and stuff like that, but not really at the end of the day, you're in there. So with that being said, you know, they feel a lot of pressure and also, you know, especially for like up and coming guys, they don't make a whole lot of money. So to them, there's a financial pressure as well. Cause they're trying to work out two, three times a day while holding a stable job, just trying to pay their bills and they're barely making any money fighting. So to them, it's like every fight matters, you know, and all the financial pressure is there. So if they lose, they're out, you know, their, 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 their career is done basically. I mean, they can go and fight on other cards. Um, so there's just so much more that goes into it. You know, even at the lowest level in the NFL, they make what half a million dollars a year, $600,000 a year. Not to discredit them by any means, because they are, you know, high level, the highest of the highest level athletes, and it is a combat sport. Um, and, you know, that that's that's pretty much it with with fighters is they just deal with a whole lot more pressure. You know what I mean? Everything's on them. So. Do you believe fighters have. Like they're mentally tougher than anybody else because like you just mentioned they have to go through that go through the lower levels the regional scene they have to work a job they have to train three times you know three times a day twice a day or whatever and take care of a family and then they still have to go out and perform and they ra rise through the ranks that way you know does that take a special type of person already you know without even having the mental coaching coming later on no oh, 100 percent, man 100 percent. you know most people will just give up on that journey and just say, fuck it, this ain't for me, you know? And yeah, it, it really does take a, a special person to work through injury. And, and, and another thing too, you know, with fighting, like these guys fight three, maybe four, if they're lucky five times a year. So if you're fighting three times a year and you lose, like, man, it takes a while to get that one back. You know what I'm saying? Like basketball, baseball, hockey, they got a game the next day. They can go and just, you know, let it go and move on. Uh, you know, even football is you got 16, 17 games, however many it is. So fighting is like, man, all this pressure is building up to this one moment. And then once that's done, it's like, I don't, I don't get to prove myself for another three, four months. Um, so yeah, man, it, it really, it takes a, a special motherfucker to be able to, to do all that, you know, and props to those guys. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to 
work with fighters. I go, look, if I can, if I can help these guys with their anxiety and their depression and their whatever, then, you know, Joe Schmo that's having anxiety about, you know, what's his next job going to be or, you know, whatever like that, it will be easy. But the funny thing is it's all easy. It's all everybody's in, in, in everybody's mind, everybody's problems are, are up here, right? No matter if it's, they're anxious about paying the cell phone bill or, you know, anxious about going in a fight. So everybody's problem matters. Everybody's the same, but it's just when you can take somebody who's isn't sure if they're going to win a fight and they can, and you can help them perform their best. It shows everybody else like, Hey, this stuff must really work. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Once I found out about you, now you're on my list, you know, like, like David Goggins, like your Instagram stories, you know, I'll, I'll go, f I'll flip through it and listen to what you have to say. It's like part of my routine now oh, that kind of gets me pushing through. And that's why I wanted to have, have you on here and talk with you because you, you, you inspire me too. Cause you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? Like you went out there and you know, like we just talked about, it takes a special kind of motherfucker to go through the regional scene and go to the highest level and still bring in a mental coach, which makes your job so much harder, but you kind of embrace this pressure of like, I want the underdog. Yeah, I, I want, exactly. which is incredible, man. Yeah, I want I I, I want to be the career reviver. <laughs> I want the person to come to me like, yo, I'm fucked up. Like I'm about to get cut. Uh, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen. And then turn that person around and just reprogram their entire mind. And then you know they go out and you know the thing is, it would be great if they could win every single fight. Obviously, people are gonna lose, but the the it's not necessarily even about winning or losing. It's about getting them to perform their best. And like I said, the work that we do not only will help them out in their fighting, but every aspect of their life. So even if they lose the fight, they still win in all these other areas and they'll be able to deal with those things and go, fuck, man, you know, I did, I performed my absolute best. It just wasn't my night, but now they can go, wow, I'm on a whole nother level. Even, even if I lost this fight, they're still excited about the next coming fights because they have this whole new mentality on how to approach it. So, you know, I, I love it, man. This is like, like I said, this is my passion. This is what I do. And, you know, we all go through, everybody's a fighter at some level, maybe not physically, but everybody's fighting, you know, paying their rent. Everybody's fighting, putting food on their tables. Everybody's fighting just to make ends meet. So, you know, and that's why it's so special to me because you know, I've dealt with all the insecurities and, and jealousy and, you know, uh, uh, anxiety and fear of the future. Oh my God, what's going to happen? Money and all these other things. So I know what it feels like to have all those pressure and I know what people are going through. So to be able to help them, like when I help somebody and, and they, you know, they send me a text or, or a video or whatever, it gives me like this little hit of like joy. I'm just like, oh yeah. You know, fuck, I, I, I'm glad I was able to help that person change their life. And I'll tell you, man, I was not like this before. Like, you see me, the way I talk, the way I, I talk about things, I was the furthest from this person. So I am living proof that, the, that this stuff really works. I wish we could have known each other before because then you'd go, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, when I first started doing this, all my friends doubted me because they're like, wait, you were just this way. Three days later, you're like this. Who the fuck? Like, are you pretending to be somebody? And it's like, no, this person was always in me. I just was scared to bring him out because I was worried. You know, I came up with this thing that uh, I, I think I came up with it. That the big, this is the, there's a, a very big phobia out there. It's the it's the most it's the most prevalent phobia than any other phobia. It's the fear of what are other people gonna think of me? If I do this, oh my God, what is everybody gonna say? What are they gonna do? What are they gonna talk about behind my back? And that fear, that phobia of 
what are other people going to think of me holds people back from really pursuing the things that they want to pursue. And, you know, you'll have, and that's how I was. I was just fucking selling insurance. So I was like, you know, I just felt like this is what I should do. And I make money and this and that. But really I had all this stuff built up inside me that was just wanting to come out. But I was so worried about what are people going to say? What are people going to think? And finally, once I get rid of that, all of those same motherfuckers that doubted me, it's funny because I just got a text message from this guy who my buddy went out one night. This guy sees my buddy and starts talking shit about me. And my buddy's like, yo, what the fuck? Like, you know, he kind of checked him. And then this motherfucker's texting me right now. Hey, bro, I'm going to be out in Vegas, you know, da, 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 da. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck you. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I love, I, I, I love the laughter. I love when people doubt me because it just motivates me even more. You know what I mean? Do you think that that is something that's healthy? Because I have that kind of like similar mentality myself. Is like yeah. I feel like everybody is is against me in in certain ways. Not everybody, but you know, there's certain people yeah, out yeah. there that don't want me to, you know, succeed in a certain way or you know get a certain opportunity. And for myself, you know, in like being in MMA media. Like, I'm based in South Korea. That's, like, on the other side of the globe. You know, most of the big media for mixed martial arts is based in North America, right? So all the mm. opportunities are there. So when I see some people that I, I've worked with before getting opportunities, you know, I'm happy for them. But at the same time, I'm thinking, like, it, you know, of course, I'm thinking, hey, how come I'm not getting any opportunities? You know, like, how come I've been yeah. on my grind since you know, 2014, you know, I've been uh -huh. doing this all different, you know, at all different levels. And right. then, so I, I, in, in, in a way, I just let kind of like let that drive me. Cause I figured like it, something will eventually come. It's going yeah. to come. I don't know when it's coming is, is, is letting the negativity drive you. Is that something that should, is that something that's healthy? Do you I, think for somebody? A hundred percent, man. You need, you need fuel on both ends. You need the, 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 you need the negative fuel, the negative energy, and you need the positive energy. Now the difference is how do you perceive the negative energy? You know, if you perceive it in a way that it's going to make a huge impression on, if you let, if you, the laughter makes you go, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I should just, you know, keep to myself or whatever. If that's how you're going to perceive it, then that's not good for you. But if you go, all right, motherfucker, I see you laughing. Okay, just wait, just fucking wait. And you're going to be begging to be my friend. So I believe 100%, you know, there's, there's very few feelings in the world that give you that sort of like rush of saying, this is what I'm going to fucking do. And then you do it. Like what? There's not very many better feelings in the world than that. You know, telling people what you're going to do and then doing it right in front of them. So what I would say is if this is a new thing for you, if you're fragile at, at putting yourself out there, you know, first of all, you should book a session with me and, and we'll get all that cleared up, number one. Number two, if you don't, then what you need to do is just start off only telling the people that you know aren't going aren't gonna, to you know, discourage you. And then slowly build it up, start to build up your wins, and then eventually you'll have the – you know, balls or vagina to go out there and just be who you're supposed to be. Uh, but again, I, I 100% know that it drives me. It also, the, the, the praise and people saying that, you know, they're proud of me or they're happy for me or whatever, that also drives me as well. And here's another thing. Those same people that are praising you, not every one of them is, is, is really wants you to win. They're just, they're just throwing it in there just in case, you know, you, you do make it so that, they can, when they make it, they're like, Hey man, remember, remember that one time, you know? So you, and you, and you know, you get that gut feeling like, okay, this person's just trying to hop along for the ride. And this person really is happy for me. So you got to be your own, you know, gauge of that. You got to kind of uh, feel within yourself what feels right. So yeah, man, I, I would still, you know, um, allow that to motivate you, you know? Yeah. Cause I do have people around me that are positive that give me positive energy and, you know, and, and express happiness for, for me and what I'm doing. Right. But then it's me, it's my mind inside, you know, like what I'm thinking, like, you know, should I just give this shit up? Should I just fucking 
get rid of yeah. all this shit that I bought and like invested my time and my money and effort into because it's never going to manifest into anything. And it comes in, you know, once in a while, it comes into my mind, it creeps in there, you know, mm -hmm. and then, and then I pop out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. But you know why it's because of like guys like you, I go on the Instagram, I look at David Goggins and those yeah. types of like, they kind of bring you back, people. right? Yeah. And it pulls me back. So it's like, we need people like you, you know, lots yeah. of people need people like you, even though we might not be doing sessions with you, you know, but just, even the just hits, by yeah. following you on social media and, and kind of listening to your little tidbits that you give out those little gems, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of, I actually like the one that you mentioned earlier about, you know, saying what you want to do, like, like expressing to everybody that what you are going to accomplish. Right. I kind mm -hmm. of, lately have been doing that to myself you know like mm -hmm. okay this is what i'm going to accomplish you know you mentioned it earlier could you talk a little bit more about that yeah so here's the secret okay here here's the a million dollar secret if anybody's going to take away anything from this really pay attention okay so we have basically been taught you know especially in sports throughout our whole life that to reach for the stars and think big and and go beyond your, you know, just beliefs and stuff like that, right? Like you hear people like whoever, Oprah or Will. Okay, so the secret, <laughs> like I said, the secret and then it click. All right, so here's here's the deal. And listen to the whole, listen to the whole thing before you start going, oh, this guy is just talking bullshit, okay? So we have been taught to think big and thinking big is great, okay? Here's the problem with thinking big. When you think big and what you're thinking about, you don't 100% believe. Now, I'm not saying you say, I'm going to be a champion or I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. Everybody can say what they want to say. I'm talking about when the feelings in your body are congruent with the words that are coming out of your mouth. Okay? So here's what happens. Let, let's just play along. Let me and you. Let's just do this with me. Okay? I want you mm. to think about, okay, let's say... I want you to think about being like uh, Ariel Hawani, right? Your own ESPN show, okay? And when you think about having that and why you would want it, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel incredible, you know? Incredible, right? It makes me feel successful, yeah. Successful. Now, I want you to think about how you're going to have, how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen. How do you feel now? I don't feel incredible. <laughs> I don't feel no. successful. Here's why. When you think about a goal and you think about the what and the why, which is whatever you want, why you want it, you feel great. As soon as you start thinking about how it's going to happen or why it's going to happen, you are literally, be, you can't predict the future. You don't have a crystal ball. Right. You could have an outline of kind of what you want to do, but exactly step by step, nobody knows. So you're literally trying to make your brain come up with an impossible answer. It's like putting a calculus problem in front of somebody that doesn't even know they're adding and subtracting. They just look at it and go, oh, God, I don't want to do this. Let me put it away. So it's the same thing. And here's what happens. Here's why goals never come in. People never get what they want is because when they think about what they want, they immediately have to think about how and when, because we're so impatient. I got to know how, I got to know when, right? So when you think about this goal and you feel bad and you can feel the negative feelings in your bodies, here's what happens. Your unconscious mind's job is to protect you and to keep you alive at all costs. It doesn't know the difference between what's good and what's bad as far as a specific situation. All it knows is that when you get a bad feeling, it wants to get you away from that feeling because it feels like you're literally in danger, right? So when you think about a goal and you think about how and when, and it makes you feel bad, what's your unconscious, unconscious mind associating with that goal? I'm asking you. It just, yeah, it just, you know, it confuses me. It confuses you. So every time you, every time your unconscious mind goes, oh, this guy wants to be an analyst or an ESPN, whatever, it's making them feel bad. We're going to get away from that. 
So you will unconsciously do things to sabotage yourself in order to get the things that you want. So in order to get the things that you want, number one, you got to stop fucking making goals. Okay. I know I said that a couple of times, but because what is a goal? What is an actual goal? What do you think of when you think of a goal? Goal is an end. Okay. Goal what is, is a goal. End. What is a goal in sports? In in in, in sports. Like think of a, a goal is soccer. A, an accomplishment. Well, yeah. oh, a goal in soccer good. would be a World Cup. No, a goal would literally be hitting the ball in the in the net, right? Oh, okay, okay. Right. So, yeah. what happens when you try to score a goal? What can happen? There's two things: you miss or you score. Exactly. So when you set a goal, you are literally telling your unconscious mind, well, it may or may not happen. You're kind of like being like, well, if it happens, cool. If not, whatever. So the, what you need to do is when you get a goal, you need to look at that goal. Okay, is this something I really want? And you need to make a decision. You just decide that whatever it is you want, you're going to have it and you don't care what you have to do as long as it's legal, moral, and ethical that you are going to get it. Now, it's no longer a goal. It's a decision that you've made. You feel the difference between setting a goal and making a decision? It's the same thing as if I were to go to the grocery store, right? I don't say I have a goal of going to the grocery store because that implies that I might or may or may not do it, right? I just make a fucking decision. I get in my car and I go to the grocery store. And your goals have to be the same thing. It has to be a decision that you've made and you're just going to do it. And you put the blinders on and you just go 100% full force. So stop making goals. It's all bullshit. You got to make decisions. Pick what you want. Decide you're going to do whatever it takes and then do it. One last thing before we go. So you talked about listening to to – People talk and 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 you, and you kind of, it's almost like you have this internal battle, right? Like I'm good enough, I'm not good yeah, enough. Yep. Here's the unfortunate thing, and this is what I've 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 honestly listened to more the people that I know personally, more books, more audio tapes, more YouTube inspirational videos than anybody I know personally, and I know a lot of high level people that do that kind of stuff, and. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if your unconscious mind has limiting beliefs, you can sit there and take in, it, take in all the positive information that you want if you're, because your unconscious mind is 95% of your brain power. So when you're listening to information, you're taking it in at the conscious level. Yeah, some of it sticks at the unconscious, which is good. But overall, if you have limiting beliefs that don't coincide with the information you're taking in, you take it in, you process it, your mind goes, no, that's not possible. Let leaves it out. That little gold nugget is now gone into the abyss. So you can really, I mean, it's good. I'm not saying to not do that. But in order to truly be aligned consciously and unconsciously, which means that when you when you have this thing that you want and, and, and this information you're taking in, that your unconscious mind says, yes, we can do that. Mm -hmm. You have to reprogram your unconscious mind. That is the, now, again, you can do it the other way and you can listen to all that stuff on, and it's good. You have to literally just brainwash yourself all the time when you're sleeping, when you're awake, that's the only way to do it. But by reprogramming your unconscious through hypnosis and timeline therapy, et cetera, it is the quickest, fastest, most effective way to go from being one extreme, you know, smoking for 30 years and then quitting in one hour, <laughs> you know, being addicted to food, which is even worse than smoking and going keto the very next day or whatever it is. So if you want to really, really see a change, I would advise you to seek a local hypnotist. <laughs> All right. You can't get a hold of me. <laughs> no doubt, man. Well, yeah, man, uh, I see that uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they probably need help from a hypnotist. You know, mm -hmm. like I see it in, people in my family now, you know, that from this little chat that we had, you know, from like phobias to, you know, like being scared of bugs. My daughter's scared of bugs, you know, and I'm pretty uh -huh. sure that has to just do with something in her subconscious that she needs help with. And uh -huh. uh, 
yeah, I might have to get, you know, because, you know, that gets annoying sometimes, you know, like you take your daughter out to the park and yeah. she's scared of every little thing flying around in the in the yeah. park. So I just worked with this girl the other day. She had, she was nine years old. She has cancer. She was the youngest person I ever met with when her dad um, um, when her dad hit me up. I honestly had never worked with somebody that young, but he's like the youngest person I worked with was like 13. And he's like, yeah, can you, can you help her? She needs help with taking her medication. She has cancer and she doesn't want to take her meds. So I was like, uh, yeah, let's do it. So, uh, I went in like, I don't know if this is going to work. I've never worked with the nine and man, it was like the funnest session I've ever had because she just let her imagination just run completely wild and she had so much fun with it. Um, but yeah, I'll tell you what, if you want, we could do, we could do a session right now. In, in, in thanking you for having me on your show. It'll be quick. You can edit it out. You can do whatever. It's not, we only have to do the hypnosis. Hypnosis is just one of the things that I do. I do many other things. And we can basically, mm. we will tap into the root cause of your fear, get rid of it, and you are going to see an immediate difference in your business. So what do you say, my man? You want to do it? Oh, no doubt. No All right, doubt. let's do it. <laughs>